Well, I just have a one word I would like to pass finally on to you, especially you young people. So now listen, if you're slightly going to sleep, wake up. <laughs> um, uh, you sang a, a song, I Want to Change the World. I don't think you'll ever change the world unless first you becoming a living sacrifice to God. If you look at church history, every single person who has changed the world has been a living sacrifice to God. I could give you a few examples. I think of Count Sensendorf, Nicholas Count Sensendorf. He was just an ordinary young man. Of course, he came from an aristocratic family, a noble family. But one day he went into a museum in one of the German cities, and he saw the picture. It was of the Lord Jesus crucified. He stood before that picture for two hours. He couldn't get away from it. And underneath was written in German, I have done all this for you. What have you done for me? Count Zinzendorf was converted that day by that picture, by the Lord Jesus, by that picture. He lived to change the whole of Moravia. He set up a refuge for refugees from Catholic persecution, which was terrible. Every single uh, fountain in Salzburg saw Anabaptists drowned, men, women, and children, put in sacks with weights and tipped into the water. Everywhere through Austria, through what we call now the Czech Republic, Slovakia, um, it happened. He set up a refuge, and it was upon those people that the Holy Spirit fell and began the 100 years prayer meeting. It lasted 100 years. Those Moravians, like their founder, went everywhere. They chose to go to the lepers. They contracted leprosy because they didn't understand the disease. And then thanked the Lord that they had leprosy so that they could speak in a way that lepers would understand. They sold themselves as slaves to the black slaves that were being brought from Africa in order to reach the slaves. They went to the Himalayas, to the highest places on the face of the earth. They went to the Eskimos. They went everywhere where missionaries didn't want to go, the more comfortable Christian missionaries who wanted nice homes and lots of servants. That was the Moravian brethren. One of the most remarkable chapters in the history of the church. Or oh, I take Dear John Wesley, he was a legalist, you know. No wonder they called him a Methodist. He did everything by method. But he hadn't, he didn't know the Lord. He was a vicar, a minister. Didn't know the Lord. But he thought he would go as a missionary to um, the Red Indians here, in what were then called the colonies. <laughs> From which you got gloriously your freedom. Um, the, but he came across here and he preached and preached and preached all over these colonies to Red Indians and never saved one of them. He wrote in his journal, I've come all these thousands of miles 
to win the Red Indians, but to save them. But who will save me? On his journey over, he had to go to Holland to get a ship. And on the ship were a whole bunch of Moravian missionaries. <laughs> they were running away from persecution in Germany and Austria. A colossal storm hit the boat halfway across the Atlantic. Even the sailors and the captain believed that the ship was going to go down and there was no hope for anybody. They threw the cargo overboard, everything that could they threw overboard, didn't do a thing. Wesley believed that he was going to drown. And then he heard singing, and he thought to himself, I'm in heaven. <laughs> this is the angel singing. But he saw the singing was coming from the bow of the ship. And he saw a door slightly open and light on the other side. And he gingerly opened the door to find 40 Moravian refugees with babies in their arm, children on their lap, singing as if they were in church somewhere on the continent of Europe. And he thought to himself, oh God, I wish I had that kind of faith. When he came back to Britain, he was a failed missionary. <laughs> and he heard of a Moravian preacher who was going to preach in Fleet Street in London. And so he went to hear him. This dear Moravian preacher actually was reading Martin Luther's preface to Galatians. And as he read it, Wesley described it like this. A strange warming took place in my heart. Dear old Wesley, he was such a legalist. To have a strange warming in his heart <laughs> was like a furnace as far as he was concerned. <laughs> He got saved. <coughs> that was the beginning of the evangelical awakening. That's what you need for Britain. But Wesley never gave up. At 94 years of age, he was still riding horseback in British weather, and that is something. <laughs> in rain, in gale, all kinds of conditions, it didn't matter. At 94, he was still preaching four times a day and riding in between each place, sometimes 50 miles on horseback and preaching. <laughs> that dreadful king that lost you colonies Some mistress of his said to him, Sire, can't you do something about these weird preachers? Weird preachers, he said, Madam. Who are these weird preachers? She said, well, this John Wesley and um, Whitfield. Well, he said, what are they doing? The whole crowds are following them. Really, he said. Well, he said, I could make him a bishop. <laughs> that will take the fire out of him. <laughs> when Wesley died, that same old king who lost the colonies decreed three days of mourning and decreed that John Wesley should be buried in Westminster Abbey. If you want to change the world, you've got a price to pay. 
you have to be a living sacrifice. Now, let me explain. I won't go on for much longer because I'm sure you're tired, but um, when you read the gospel, not the gospel, when you read the Roman letter of the Apostle Paul, you have the greatest exposition of the gospel in the Bible. The first eight chapters are all to do with the gospel. Ends with those wonderful words, there is therefore now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. Then you have three chapters about election. Not just the election of the church, but the election of Israel. And in those three chapters, Paul discusses, is it possible for God to elect a people and then unelect them? To save them and then unsave them? And that ends with this incredible chapter that I've already quoted to you when you asked your question. Uh, and so all Israel shall be saved. And he goes on to say, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Now, irrevocable means irrevocable. It's quite simple. God means exactly what he says. Now, listen. Now the Apostle Paul sums the whole thing up, both the gospel and election. And he says this. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to the Lord, which is your spiritually intelligent worship. Now, you can have emotional worship. You can have worship that just comes from the flesh. But you can have also spiritually intelligent worship. What does that mean? It means that in cold blood you give yourself to the Lord as a living sacrifice. Put it another way. Every time these apostles wrote a letter, not always, but nearly always, they say, so-and-so, a bond slave of God and of the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. A bond slave. Oh, we don't like that. <laughs> I mean, hired servant. There were two words in Greek, doulos and this other one. Doulos just simply means a hired servant. You have rights, you have hours, you have wages. You have time off. A bond slave, slave is the Lord's for 24 hours of every seven days of the week. What is your spiritually intelligent worship and service? It is to be a bond slave of the Lord Jesus. Your will surrendered to him. Your life surrendered to him. The keys of your life given to him. It means that if you're planning a career for yourself, you better drop it. Let him plan it. If you're planning that you're going to go here or there or wherever to live, drop it. Let him plan it. You are not your own anymore. You are his. You see, we have lots of converts, but few disciples. So, I finish with one last thought. It's what the Lord gave me early this morning. 
It's from Isaiah chapter 6. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And the seraphim flew backwards and forwards, saying, crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Then Isaiah, who was just a young man, just your age, all of you youngsters here. I say youngsters, I mean I'm 81. Um, the Lord actually, Isaiah said, Oh God, I am a man of unclean lips, living amongst the people of unclean lips. I don't know exactly what he thought, whether it was that he wasn't keeping kosher law, I don't know. I have no idea. Or whether it was that the, the kind of talk coming out of his thing wasn't good. But he considered it unclean. And then a seraphim flew from the throne of God and with a tongue took a coal out of the altar and placed it on the lips of Isaiah and said, your sins are atoned for. Then Isaiah, this young man, heard God, the Almighty, crying out, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah said, can you believe it? <laughs> Here am I. Send me. I wonder if you want to change the world. If you want to change society, have you any idea of the cost? I will tell you what the cost is. Your life, your self-life, your whole being, that's the cost. You'll never regret it. I'm 81 years of age, and I've served the Lord since I was 12 and a half. I decided very early on to be totally devoted to the Lord Jesus. I don't regret it. I've had so many blessings. Even all of you. You may not consider yourself to be a blessing. But we're, you're all blessings. It is an amazing thing to serve the Lord. Do you think that the Lord is going to allow you to serve him for your whole of your life? To surrender your will to him to change the world and that he will just throw you on one side like these poor chickens that are in batteries that all they can do is make eggs and are just worn out can't even be used for animal food poor things do you think God is like that? He's like some great factory owner who work you to death. No. The Lord is marvelous. His compassions, they don't fail. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Now, dear young person, here's the challenge. You want to change the world? You want to change American society? You want to change the society of this little community? Why don't you start by saying, here am I, Lord. Take me. Just as I am, take me. Start my education.
And I believe the Lord could use some of you to change the society. The power of the Lord could fall upon us all. You see, the missing thing in our Christianity is fire. We have no fire in our prayer meetings. That's why they're so sometimes so boring. There's no fervency, no fire. But when there is the fire of his love kindled in our hearts, it changes everything. I remember a wonderful old hymn that that dear old legalist when once the Lord warmed his heart and filled him with the Holy Spirit wrote. I don't know if I can even quote it correctly. O thou who camest from above, the pure celestial fire to impart, kindle a sacred flame of love on the mean altar of my heart. There let it burn for thee with inextinguishable blaze and trembling to its source return in humble prayer and fervent praise, ready for all thy acts of love. My, how does it go? My, my, my acts of faith and love that, that, that repeat <laughs> till death thine endless mercies seal and make the sacrifice complete that's what I hope the Lord will do for some of you young people now I want to just say let's bow our heads in prayer and I want to say if there's anyone here who wants to be a sacrifice a living sacrifice stand up don't, don't all, no, listen, I, I don't want all of you standing up. It doesn't mean anything. Think again. This will cost you your self-life. Sit down if you love your self-life. <laughs> if you love your self-life, sit down. But if you're ready to be a living sacrifice and to surrender your will to the Lord, stand up as a, as an, a token that this is what you want. Now listen to me. The Lord will take you at your word. You will be challenged over the next few days as to whether you mean, meant what you've done this day. Let the fire of God fall <coughs> on you. Let the Holy Spirit indwell you. Listen to the Lord and totally obey him. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, of, of, of Mary to the servants, the mother of Jesus. Whatsoever he says, do it. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that you will take note of this. Help us, Lord. We are living in a situation that is dark and full of confusion and judgment. Now, Lord, we've talked about changing the world. We want to change the world. We want to be people that you can use to change the world, to bring others to yourself. But only you can do it. Lord, you see these young people specifically, as well as the older ones, who have who want to be a living sacrifice. Lord, will you take every one of us at our word and start the education and the training that will make us men and women of God. Lord, let that fire of yours fall upon us in such a way that it will become like the Colorado Springs fire. It will leap from place to place. It will go through this nation like a great wildfire. Lord, hear our prayer, for we ask it in the name 
of our Messiah, the Lord Jesus. Amen. <laughs>